I'm Mark Schwindemann. I'm a physician here at Ada West. I have been practicing now for 12 years in dermatology. I started my residency in 2009 um, at the San Antonio Military Medical Association in San Antonio, Texas. I was an army dermatologist for eight years and I got here to Idaho at Ada West about four years ago. I saw lots of unusual things in the army. <laughs> We had a lot of, um, unfortunately, we had a lot of burn and blast victims. So I was at the trauma center that um, many of our soldiers and airmen were sent to from Afghanistan in Iraq. And so we had a burn unit, and so we, we did a lot of that. So I went to med school thinking I was going to be an OB. Um, when I did my first rotation in that, I, I didn't have, I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. Um, I talked to my brother here in Idaho, who's a family doc, and he lives in Eagle. And I asked him if he had a dermatologist that he referred to, and he called Dr. Burr, and Dr. Burr said he would take me on as a student. This is back in 2007. And I came here for two weeks, and after the first day, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And I stayed with Dr. Burr for the two weeks, and he said, Mark, if you get a dermatology residency, when you're done and trained, I'll hire you. <laughs> and so we stay in touch all those years. And I told him, Dr. Burr, but I gotta give four years back to the army after my residency. And he said, that's okay. And so we kept in touch all those years. And then when I was ready to get out, I really only looked at either staying in or coming here. That's, those are my two choices. And in the end, we chose to, to go civilian and live in Idaho. Uh, I love everyone that I work with. I love this beautiful new building that was built. Not for me, but I get to enjoy it. Um, I work, I have great colleagues from the support staff to the other providers. I would go to any one of them myself. They're fun to work with. I like dermatology because I, I can, um, I like the mix of the surgical and medical aspect of dermatology. So I see anywhere from the regular run-of-the-mill acne and warts, and I go all the way up to the intense, what we call complex medical dermatology. Um, but then I do a lot of surgery as well, and I really enjoy being able to do both. Uh, we are making a lot of progress in, um, in the eczema, in the realm of eczema, especially this year. In fact, the, the, the drug that has come, there is a drug that's come out in the last three or four years, which I feel like has really changed our abilities to treat these patients much safer. And I would call it a groundbreaking therapy. And it's led to some other therapies as well. So I feel like we're really advancing in that well. I think our, our, our systemic treatments for melanoma are also advancing better than they did when I started dermatology 10 years ago. Well. Aside from the 50 emails I get a day from every dermatology source out there about the new list literature, um, I, I visit uh, a medical service online called Up to Date numerous times a week on conditions to make sure I'm doing the most current treatments. Not just the most current, but the best evidence based medicine treatments. I go to conferences and then a huge advantage we have here for practices of this size is that we can, we have difficult cases and we want a second opinion, we have immediate access to it right away. And we all do it for each other. One of the other docs here will come in and see the patient with me or I'll go in one of their rooms when they have a patient, they just want another set of eyes on. And so that's, that happens when you're in residency all the time. Um, but if you're in a solo practice, you can't do that. But here we, we can. So before I became a dermatologist, I was published several times um, for continuing medical education for dermatologists in regards to some um, rare conditions. Um, I presented several times at the American Academy of Dermatology some uncommon or what I would call rare or once in a lifetime cases that I had come up against. And I did some undergraduate research too, which was not pertinent to dermatology. Well, it gives you more, more of an appreciation for the amount of time it takes to one, do a study, and then two, do something with the results of that study. So when we get drugs in the pipeline, um, 
there's been years of research even before they're even able to be prescribed. <laughs> I wish patients understood better that um, there's some things they can do to prevent skin cancer and there's some things that they just can't do. So skin cancer is, has numerous factors, but the two leading ones I would say are genetics and sun exposure. And we can only really control our sun exposure. Can't control my genetics. So some people will unfortunately grow skin cancers who've never had a significant amount of sun exposure. Um, and I also wish that patients knew that the sooner we find something, the easier it is to treat. Is that with skin cancer or everything? It's probably everything in life. <laughs> <laughs> but skin cancer specifically. <laughs> I think the most important thing, and this goes for me with in my life and my family is um, having a trusting relationship with your provider. Which means that you need to be able to talk to them, you need to be able to contact them, you need to be able to get answers from them, responses from them. You need to understand that you know when you're with the provider, you're 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 number one, I and mean, you always should be. And you should be a close number one when you're not with the provider either. Anyone who's had skin cancer, anyone who has something in their skin that they're concerned about or is affecting their life, because there's more than skin cancer in dermatology. We, I see a lot of people with chronic rashes that will be with them throughout their life that we have to control with some uh, uncommon medications. And some of those rashes, if left unchecked, are, are totally fine. They're not going to overly hurt the person. It might be more cosmetic, but some of those rashes can be very dangerous. And so most patients, when, when we diagnose something like that, we, well, all of them, we, we, we have them understand kind of where they're at in that spectrum. One thing that I hear a lot is a, a lot of people will use essential oils to treat things in the skin. And I think there's definitely a place for essential oils and alternative medicine for sure. I think one of the myths though is that essential oils can't hurt you. Because <laughs> they definitely can. And we see a lot of what we call contact dermatitis or allergic reactions to essential oils. And so they, they are billed as being natural and we like that they're natural, but poison ivy is natural too. Um, there's more to medicine than the medicine itself. I love the climate. I love that we have four seasons. I love that I can have a huge garden and I can grow things here. What's your favorite item activity? Gardening. Favorite sports team? BYU Cougars. The best health practice you do for yourself? I get eight hours of sleep every night. <laughs> what advice would you give to yourself at age 15? Um, it's okay not to be perfect. This line of work, what career would you want to pursue? Forestry. <laughs> uh, growing up, I mowed a lot of lawns and did yard work. And so I learned about hard work and sweat and, and um, appreciating the minimal paycheck that I got. Caring. I love Disney. <laughs> Disney everything. I don't know, there's something about going to Disney that uh, just, one, it brings out the kid in you, but you kind of can leave your cares to the side. It gives you those childhood memories mm -hmm. of um, uh, watching the Disney movies on VHS. <laughs> My favorite ride is Space Mountain. I love that ride, I don't know why. And I like Thunder Mountain a lot too. But I love seeing how happy my kids are when we do have the chance to go. Are your kids all like big, big time fans? Uh, most of them. I have five kids. I think a few of them just, they, I mean, they like going, but I have one particular child who just, he's a special needs boy and he just loves everything Disney. And he talks about it all the time. We watch Disneyland fireworks almost every night before bed on YouTube. <laughs> That's what I do. I do have patients that sometimes cancel because they have sunburns. Um, I always laugh when I see them the next time when they tell me. 
because I never scold my patients about sunburns. They, they already, people already feel bad enough coming to see me with a sunburn. I can tell you though that when I go on vacation, I do not come back with a sunburn because I would expect my patients to, to, to razz me about that a little bit. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna know anyway. I mean, in general, I can tell if you've had a lot of sun either acutely or chronically throughout your life. I mean, it's not, it's, that's like dermatology first year training. <laughs> yeah, so if you, if you have a diagnosis of skin cancer, a new diagnosis of skin cancer, you, it depends on the kind of skin cancer. There's more genetic tendency with each one. But statistically, if you have had a skin cancer, your first degree relative should be seen by a dermatologist. Um, at some point, soon after you get your diagnosis, unless they're infants or toddlers or young children. It's, it is uncommon for children to get skin cancer, either melanoma or basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma, the common skin cancers. It's uncommon for children too. But if you have had a skin cancer, if your father or mother has had a skin cancer, that's, you should be seen at least once so that dermatologists can say, hey, you're good for a couple years or something like that. So with sensitive skin, you should avoid products that contain, I think the number one thing we would talk about is fragrance. And fragrance is a generic term, but when you flip over the bottle, you'll see it listed as just generic fragrance. You should, but a lot of people will be sensitive to a chemical called propylene glycol as well, and that's in a lot of hand creams is um, one of the ingredients. Um, and some people will have allergies to preservatives that are in creams as well. And those would be things like formaldehydes or agents like that. And so there are lines of skincare products that are over the counter, which are relatively inexpensive, maybe a dollar or two more than the other brands that are lacking those ingredients. Blue light therapy is my favorite treatment. I love blue light therapy. Uh, people don't like me for it, but it's, it can be extremely effective. Blue light therapy is a therapy where we, we clean off your skin and we apply an acid to it, and that acid is um, inactive until it's exposed to a certain wavelength of light, which happens to be blue light, the blue light wavelength in the color spectrum. So until you expose it to that, the, it, it doesn't do anything. So it's photoactivated, that's what we call it. So we paint your skin with this, and we put you under a blue light for about 16 minutes, and then the medicine is preferentially taken up by the atypical skin cells in the skin. So theoretically, if you put this on a baby's bottom, it would do minimal, if any, damage to it. Anyway, the, it gets taken up and it destroys those atypical skin cells. And one of the huge advantages of it is just one and done, meaning we have some creams that do the same thing, but you gotta use it twice a day for a couple of weeks and turn really red and it takes a couple of weeks to heal and it's uncomfortable. Um, the treatment blue light for a lot of people is uncomfortable, but you can get fantastic results out of it and you can treat the whole area at once. I'm treating precancers, actinic keratosis, although it's also FDA indicated for um, several superficial skin cancers. And so if you have somebody who has a lot of skin damage and it's hard to differentiate what's what, you, would, you could pre-treat the whole area and you'd probably get rid of some of their superficial cancers and whatever survives that treatment, then we would biopsy that for sure.